It was a show that made TV history. B-A-T-M-A-N. And turned camp into cool. To me, it was so enormously fresh and funny, I couldn't resist it. It exploded onto the pop culture scene and transformed the dynamic duo of Adam West and Burt Ward into superstars overnight. If I had a paper cup or something, I'd set it down. Uh, people would almost get into a fist fight trying to get that cup as a souvenir. Its heroes stood for what was right. Watch it, chum. The dust you're in safety. Oh, sure. And fought tirelessly against evil. It was brilliantly written, brilliantly cast. It was perfect. But on-set tensions sometimes plagued its caped co-stars. Behind our masks, we're perfectly ordinary people. And typecasting nearly ruined their careers. Do you recognize me? Those guys looked at you like, uh, oh no, well you're typecast. After filming Batman, that's all you can do. But what's the real story behind Batman's extraordinary roller coaster ride? Stay tuned. This is the Bat Time. This is the Bat Channel. Nothing to lose. Leads you to where you are today. I believe in storytelling. It's gonna make you a star. I'm still trying to figure that out. Since his creation in 1939 by artist and writer Bob Kane, the shadowy superhero Batman had been a fixture in comic books and movie serials. The alter ego of millionaire Bruce Wayne, Batman, with the help of his trusty sidekick Robin, kept the streets of Gotham City safe, fighting crime as a serious and righteous avenger. But in the mid-1960s, he would take on a whole new attitude. At that time, television networks CBS and NBC were dominating the ratings with family-oriented shows like The Munsters, Lost in Space, and Daniel Boone. In an effort to compete with its more successful rivals, struggling ABC approached 20th Century Fox and veteran producer William Dozier with a plan to create a series based on the Caped Crusader. I bought a dozen of the comic books of various vintages. So I read all these things, and I thought, they must be out of their minds. You know, it was all so juvenile. And, and so then a very simple idea struck me, and that was to overdo it. And if you overdid it, I thought, it would be funny to adults, and yet it would be stimulating the kids, the daring do, and, but you had to appeal on both levels or you didn't have a chance. Dozier then developed the pilot script with television writer Lorenzo Semple Jr. and began looking for actors, particularly those with a background in drama who also had natural comic timing. It was a tough search because uh, you've got to find an actor uh, who is prepared to play Alice in Wonderland as though it were Hamlet. An agent came in and he showed me an eight by 10 of a guy with a surfboard. He said, what do you think of this fella? I said, who is he? He said, his name's Adam West. Actor Adam West had been working steadily in Hollywood for six years, appearing in numerous television shows and feature films, mostly dramas and westerns. His only real stab at comedy had been opposite the Three Stooges in The Outlaws is Coming. In 1960, he had captured a recurring role on the hit TV series The Detectives, starring Robert Taylor. But none of these parts tapped into his most remarkable quality, his gift for quirky deadpan humor. In 1965, however, it was that comic flair which he used to send up the current James Bond craze that impressed William Dozier. I see automation displaces labor in your organization too, Dr. Slough. Ah, Captain Q, join me in a glass of delicious chocolate quick, won't you? Thank you, Doctor. I could use some energy. Incidentally, one of those torpedoes you fired at me was circling and... You're sunk. Thank you. Some people will do anything to get rich, quick. To loop. Initially, however, Adam had serious doubts about playing a cartoon-based character. 
my agent called and said they want to see at Fox about doing Batman. I said, you're kidding. I'm trying to have a serious career here. You know, get off my phone. And he said, no, they, I think they've got some uh, different ideas. I said, okay, I'll go see him. In the meantime, Charles Fitzsimons continued interviewing younger actors, hoping to find the other half of the dynamic duo, Robin. We were looking for a young kid, and my assistant, Charlie Fitzsimons, came into me one day, and he said, I think we may have found our boy. Burton Jervis was a wannabe actor and college student who was selling real estate on weekends to help pay the bills. Got an exhibition. What are you going to do now? Well, I'm going to do a couple of throws and a couple of falls. Falls? You're going to take the falls yourself? Right, I'm going to throw the, do the falls first, and then I'm going to take the throws. All right, let's see a couple of falls. Bert was only 20 years old when he tried out for the role of Robin and Robin's earnest alter ego, Dick Grayson. Ah. It was his first audition as a professional. So I met Mr. Dozier, and he says, you look just right, but the only problem is you're kind of big. I said, oh, sir, I promise you, I won't grow anymore. And he laughed, and uh, he says, I like that. Dozier loved Bert's combination of enthusiasm, sincerity, and all-American good looks, and thought he would fit perfectly with Adam's straight-faced approach to Batman. Look, between the lines, when is the time of a clock like the whistle of a train. When it's two to two. Two, two, two. Right you are. Holy caboose! But the network insisted on seeing a second pair of actors. So the producers filmed one screen test with Adam and Bert and another with Lyle Wagner and Peter Dayell. Look, between the lines, when is the time of a clock like the whistle of a train? When it's Two to two. Two, two, two. Right you are. Holy caboose. Here's another one. What has neither flesh, bone, nor nail, yet has four fingers and a thumb? A glove. Roger. Two, two, two. A glove. It's an address. It must be an address. I get it. 222 Glover Avenue. You've done it, chum. You've done it, chum. After viewing both screen tests, ABC agreed to sign Adam West and Burton Jervis. But Bert decided that people wouldn't know how to pronounce his last name, so he changed it to Ward. With the dynamic duo in place, William Dozier quickly cast the supporting roles with veteran actors. Neil Hamilton as the concerned Commissioner Gordon. Stafford Rep as the Commissioner's right-hand man, Chief O'Hara, Alan Napier as the loyal butler, Alfred, and Madge Blake as Bruce Wayne's doting Aunt Harriet. Dozier then turned his attention to the show's style. He decided to shoot in color, still relatively new to television. The use of vibrant colors in the costumes, in the sets, uh, I'm sure no one had touched anything like that before because you had these incredible reds and greens. Even Batman had the bright blues and yellows. These were colors you would see ordinarily in a comic book, but I doubt anyone had translated them so literally to the TV screen before. Dozier also planned to include many fun gadgets and props and hired world-renowned car customizer George Barris to design and build a distinctive, definitive vehicle, the Batmobile. In 65, I was contacted by Dozier. We're doing Batman. We gotta have a Batmobile. But we don't want it to look like Bob Kane's 1937 Lincoln Zephyr with a cutout bat face on the front. We want something a little bit more modern. What can you do for us? I says, great, let me give you some ideas and some sketches. The real car was a concept Lincoln Futura. I took this steel body and we reformed this dual cockpit car for Adam and Bert. I wanted to incorporate the bat features into the automobile. That means that the bat was part of the car, uh, the top of the fenders where the headlights were, where the ears, the mouth was the grill, the nose was coming off the hood and it had a chain slicer that come out. It was quite exciting. We got kind of a big thrill out of it. But Dozier and his writers knew that however stylish and hip they made it, the success of Batman rested entirely on the audience getting its unique brand of humor. In the summer of 1965, they set out to capture that humor on film in the show's pilot episode. 
There was one line in the pilot that was put in deliberately to set the tone of the humor. And that was when Batman walked into a nightclub in that ridiculous outfit. Please, it's Batman! And the maitre d' came up and said, Big side table, Batman. Uh, just look, thanks, I'll stand at the bar. I shouldn't wish to attract attention. That was the key for the humor in the show. That offbeat humor, joking against the characters. Stand clear. Unfortunately, the first test screenings held by the network to measure audience interest were disastrous. It was the lowest rating they had ever had on anything. Now, had they not already bought the show, ABC, it would never have gone on the air. But ABC's lineup of shows in the fall of 1965 was failing miserably. So executives decided to debut Batman in the coming January as part of the network's so-called second season. They even concocted a huge media blitz to promote the premiere. The pilot episode would introduce audiences to the fictional metropolis of Gotham City and its costumed crime fighters, Batman and Robin. Batman speaking. <laughs> it would also highlight the maniacal exploits of one of the dynamic duo's arch enemies, the Riddler, played by well-known impressionist and character actor Frank Gorshin. I loved the, the whole thing, loved the role, loved the idea of playing that role, and enjoyed doing it. Hold it, Riddler! Kids ask me if I still have my green tights. Game's up, Riddler. Snap on the bat cuffs. You've got me, Batman. <laughs> the show would also tantalize viewers by airing two nights a week, with the first night featuring a cliffhanger ending patterned after the old Saturday matinee serials. It wasn't planned for two nights originally, because we shot them as one-hour shows. And then it was decided to break them up into two half hours for exhibition, two nights in a week. To make the new structure work, William Dozier needed a narrator, but nobody he auditioned seemed quite right, so he handled the job himself. Will Robin escape? Can Batman find him in time? Is this the ghastly end of our dynamic duo? Answers tomorrow night, same time, same channel. With the premiere of Batman just one day away, anticipation had built to a fever pitch. ABC was looking for a miracle, while Adam West and Burt Ward were just hoping for a hit. But no one was prepared for the frenzy to come. <laughs> On January 12, 1966, Batman made its debut on the ABC television network. And that night, a huge audience tuned in to see the campy adventures of the dynamic duo. The show was an instant and overwhelming success. Atomic batteries to power. Turbines to speed. Batman broke uh, hot. Uh, it broke very big. And naturally, that's a wonderful thing to be part of. It had a 52 share of the audience, which it's unheard of. There was no question about it. It was the biggest immediate hit that had ever hit television. In 1966, America was in the midst of powerful social and political change. With the civil rights movement and the Vietnam War grabbing headlines every day, the timing seemed perfect for a show that would comically tip its hat to a simpler era when conflict could be easily defined in terms of good versus evil. One good thing did come of it, Robin. We now know who our adversary is. In Batman, evil came in the fantastic form of a series of recurring villains. Producer William Dozier called in favors to convince his famous actor friends to take the roles. Along with Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, he asked veteran stage and film actor Burgess Meredith to play the Penguin. Burgess Meredith was marvelous because of the cigarette in my face all the time, and he didn't smoke. He picked up the laugh uh, because he started to cough, smoking. So it was, eh, <laughs> Batman. <laughs> Dozier also chose one of the screen's most popular Latin lovers 
Cesar Romero to play the Joker. Once you get into a costume and you get the makeup on and the wig and them, you, you, you change completely. I mean, you just fall right into it. And it was actually a very easy character to play. Just whoop did I and laugh and scream and, uh, you know, it was just a, a ball to do. <laughs> the joker out which Batman and steals the fabulous jewel collection right out from under his nose. <laughs> in addition, Dozier brought in acclaimed Broadway star Julie Newmar, who became the Catwoman. The Catwoman is not like the others. I'll show you how to clip Batman and Robin's wings. I will prevail. Cats are sleek. Cats are fast. Cats are... Well, they're not mean. They're just wily and they grab your attention in the most seductive way. Perfect. You're learning. Other guest villains that season included Boy. Roddy McDowell as the bookworm. Do not ask for whom this spell tolls. It tolls for thee. And Victor Buono as King Tut. Failure! Abject failure! I think that Victor Buono was a genius. I loved him. I loved what I wrote. I would write him the most obscure Egyptian references, and he would just make them work. Yes, yes, and praise me, too, for the first time since the golden age of Ramses Jr. that exists the elixir of Abu Rabu Simbu, too. Throughout its first season, Batman stayed at the top of the ratings charts, and the series writers kept the jokes coming. Gosh, Batman, if we could just puzzle out how funny money is handed out by a bank. Good thinking, Robin. Time for us to go fishing, if you ask me. Fishing? But where, Batman? Where the fishing is always best, Commissioner. From a shady bank. The tone of the thing was set by Lorenzo Semple, who wrote the pilot. And then those of us who came afterwards, we just made it crazier. Holy hamburger, I'll be cut to pieces by these blades. We had more and more fun and got more bizarre, and and, uh, and they let us get away with it. I mean, the villains we fought against were never doing minor crimes. They always had major crimes. Uh, I remember one time Commissioner Gordon uh, asked Batman what he thought the objective uh, of the villains were in this particular case, and he said, their minimum objective must be the entire world. Along with the success of the show came requests for personal appearances, which Adam and Bert were happy to make. Adam was so proud of being Batman. He was in such demand. He was always going off someplace to appear in big uh, arenas and football uh, uh, coliseums and everything, coming out in his Batman outfit and all that, and uh, he loved every minute of it. I was making a personal appearance in some small town and I had to do my own laundry and so I, I went over and I dropped it in the washer and I came back and put it in the dryer and an hour later I came back and my clothes were all wet and I said, geez, I don't understand. And a little boy rode up on a bicycle and said, oh, well, the lady down the road there uh, came over and, and heard that you were here and took your clothes out of the dryer and put them on top so she could take a picture as a souvenir. Another star performer in Batman was the Batmobile. Fans of the show, as well as automotive enthusiasts, fell in love with its unique design, flashy style, and cool bat features. The car was so popular, we would take it to shows, and thousands of people would come to the shows to come and want to see that Batmobile. They did it auto shows. Adam would get $10,000 and Bert five every time they did this while the show was hot. And they enjoyed it, of course. Why not? It was good for the show. As season one came to an end, Adam and Bert were the two most famous faces on TV. Throngs of men, women, and children followed their every move, and merchandisers were lining up for their services. Everything was bat this, bat that. Let's go and have a bat lunch. Two bat burgers, medium rare. The biggest craze was bat merchandising. There were more Batman gadgets, you know, than you could shake a stick at. And lunch boxes, cups, 
goblets. In the first year, 1966, there was $75 million worth of merchandise created and sold. I mean, anything you could think of, they had something with a Batman logo on it. And the, they were amazed that it was outselling all the Bond merchandise, which up to that point had become the big seller. Adam West and Burt Ward had become pop culture icons. Batmania had swept across America and the entire world. I was watching the Batman on television, and that gave me the idea. And although even bigger things were to come for the caped crusaders, there was trouble brewing in Gotham City. This one is bigger than the lot of us. Commissioner, we need help. Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. In the spring of 1966, 20th Century Fox executives were anxious to capitalize on the success of Batman. They offered Adam West and Burt Ward lucrative contracts to appear in a big screen version of the show. Batman the movie pitted the dynamic duo against four times the usual dose of evil as the Joker, the Riddler, the Penguin, and the Catwoman united to threaten Gotham City. But original Catwoman Julie Newmar had a previous film commitment, so the role of Batman's beautiful feline adversary went to former Miss America Lee Merriweather. You're going to see the perfect crime when I get Batman in my claws. <laughs> Holy glowbot! What's going on? Released in August of 1966, the film followed the successful blueprint of the TV series, attracting a large audience with its broad, campy humor. In the motion picture, they are trying to get rid of a bomb. Four or five times, they try to get rid of it. And he stops and says, Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. That was a tough role to play, you know, because you had to be careful. He could have been just out and out ridiculous. And uh, he was great. As the second season began, however, Issues which had been bubbling under the surface during the first year began to boil over. The show's producers struggled to tighten the reins on escalating production costs, while its stars struggled with problems of their own. Both Adam and I had problems with our costumes. I mean, from tights with runs in them, to wrinkles in the ankles and knees, to uh, extreme bulges in the uh, shorts area. The Catholic Legion of Decency really got on ABC Network about the way I fit in my costume. Uh, the main problem uh, as far as appearance was the to a cowl in that uh, I needed a towel. It was so damn hot. On screen, Batman and Robin were united against evil. But off screen, tensions between West and Ward had been simmering for months. We were completely opposite. Adam had been in many shows, tremendous background, terrific actor, but very Mr. Hollywood. I mean, he wanted his tea at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And me, I'm just like this kid that doesn't care having a good time. With little acting experience, Bert was unprepared for his sudden celebrity, and many in the cast and crew felt that he let it go to his head. Bert once came up to me and said, Stanley, you're not writing me enough, you know? You're writing too much for, uh, for Adam. So in the next show, I wrote Bert an enormous part. And he came to me and he said, Stan, I worked too hard on that show. You gave me too much. Well, now I got a little annoyed. So in the next show, I had Bert kidnapped on about page six. And then I had him uh, found on about page 51. So after that show, he came up to me and he said, I'm never going to say another word to you again. One day I had to had pelt Robin with several eggs. And the camera crew came up to me and said, not two, a dozen. And I said, why, don't you like Bert? And they said, we like Bert, all right, but Bert likes himself more than we like him. So give him a dozen eggs. And at 
Franny ended up, I pelted him with two dozen rotten eggs. Ah! It was really fun. Batman was the first thing that Bert ever did. Naturally, Bert had a lot of insecurities, which made him a pain in the beep, but many times. But there were so many times that you understood it. You understood why. You have the patience for it. And Bert grew, he developed, he mellowed. But despite the occasional problems on the set, Batman still ruled the airwaves. And for producer William Dozier, it was especially satisfying to see the reaction from the Hollywood establishment. Many top performers continued to join the show's all-star roster of evildoers throughout its second season. We went a long way from the comic book, but uh, I think we were honest with the characters. We invented a few. We would tailor them to fit the personality that we were getting for the show. Batman became such a popular, tremendously popular show that it became a thing to be a villain in, in Batman, and everybody was anxious to do it. It's natural to be a little nervous, darling. Everyone is the first time. But not every guest star played a villain. Some actors appeared in cameo roles as themselves. Hey, Batman and Robin, what are you guys doing? While others turned up as their own characters from different ABC shows. Oh, it's you, Batman. Yes, citizen, you may return to your harpsichord. We're on official business. Oh. The network didn't miss an opportunity for a little cross-promotion and even used Batman to help launch another William Dozier-produced superhero series, The Green Hornet, starring Van Williams and Bruce Lee. What are you doing here? I might ask you the same question. Pursuing the enemies of law and order wherever they happen to be. Well, I don't want to hold you up from your crime fighting. Thank you, and good luck to you, Mr. Hornet. Nice to have met you. Gosh, Batman, what are they dressed like that for? I had the best opportunities there because uh, the very few people in the history of Hollywood have done that much film with that many big names in the same scenes with them. <laughs> Adam also loved finding the humor in Batman's absurd approach to civic and moral responsibility. Uh oh, better put five cents in the meter. No policeman is going to give the Batmobile a ticket. No matter, Robin. This money goes toward building better roads. We all must do our part. Good citizenship, you know. Holy taxation. You're right again, Batman. To keep the show edgy, the writers pushed the envelope especially when it came to the sexual chemistry between Batman and Catwoman. I thought that the underlying tension between Catwoman and Batman, I mean, that they really were drawn to each other sexually. When Batman says behind that cowl, he's a pretty serious cat, right? He, say, he has to say something about dating when you get out of jail. Batman, when I get out of jail, will you take me on a date? We'll have plenty of time to think about that, Catwoman. Several years, I'm afraid. If I were to kiss you, would you think I was a bad girl? Kissing is one of the most natural things in the world. Uh, some people kiss almost every day, and I'm told. Well, we were having fun being bad, and. Everybody loves to have fun being bad, as long as they can get away with it. It's all over, Catwoman. I'll do everything I can to rehabilitate you. Marry me. Everything except that. A wife, no matter how beauteous or affectionate, would severely impair my crime fighting. But I can help you in your work. As a former criminal, I'd be invaluable. What about Robin? Robin? Oh, I've got it. We'll kill him. When he wasn't battling dastardly criminals, Adam West enjoyed going out on the town and was often seen in the company of Hollywood's most beautiful leading ladies. But he took his Batman celebrity very seriously, especially when it came to keeping up the caped crusader's image in the eyes of his youngest fans. We had kids on the set all the time, and Adam was wonderful with the kids. 
He would visit with them between setups and let them come and sit on his knee and so on and so forth, and the kids had a ball. But despite Batman's recognition and the fame it had brought to its two stars, cracks began to appear in the bat armor. Gotham City was about to come under attack by a villain that not even the dynamic duo could defeat. Surprise, Batman! Quick, Robin, down behind the bat shield. Surprise and good night! As Batman's second season was coming to an end, ratings were beginning to dip. Playing on back-to-back -back nights was creating overexposure. In response, ABC cut the show down to once a week for its third year. We hit so big and the ratings were so outstanding, there was no way to go but down the scale. In an attempt to keep the series successful, the producers of Batman decided to add a new cast member, bringing in actress Yvonne Craig to play the third Gotham City crime fighter, Batgirl. That girl came in in the third year, as I recall, to try to breathe new life into the show, give it an extra new Philip that would hopefully help. For Adam West and Burt Ward, however, the introduction of Batgirl seemed a desperate move. When somebody's added, like a co-star, uh, it's in the nature of the beast, the actor, to say, why? Why do you need somebody else? Aren't I wonderful enough? But, you know, you, you get a little insecure. Like Adam, Batman's writers found it difficult to include a third leading character in the mix, especially with the show's airtime reduced. In addition, Julie Newmar was once again unavailable. So the producers hired the sleek and sultry actress, Eartha Kitt, to wear the cat suit. She may be evil, but she is attractive. You'll know more about that in a couple of years. Now, are you coming quietly, Catwoman, or must we use force? Your silver-tongued oratorio has convinced me, Batman. I hereby remit myself to your muscular custody. Don't try to pull the wool over our eye slits. Now, would I do a thing like that? But the new changes failed to halt the decline of the show's ratings. As a result, the network started to cut Batman's production budgets it became increasingly difficult to maintain the high standard the producers had set for themselves to make the humor work. What is the world coming to? We can't stop to worry about that now. It was really no time for us to play with the characters and play with the scene and create the kind of excitement and spontaneous uh, craziness that made our show successful. So I, I would say that it was the financial reasons that really restrained our creativity which ultimately reduced our ratings the biggest problem is we had a half hour show and we had essentially about 12 characters in a half hour by the time you get around giving people lines you barely have time for a plot you could do the elaborate stunts and of course there was no uh, pickle in the middle i mean you couldn't put them into jeopardy it was a very expensive show to do the sets were expensive the special effects were expensive. The cost was killing us. An example of how they were cutting costs, there's an episode with Dr. Cassandra, played by Ida Lupino, and Howard Duff is playing her, uh, her associate, her real-life husband. And they have developed this way to turn the, all the criminals of Gotham City invisible, and they're going to unleash this wave of terror. And in order to, to fight fire with fire, in essence, Batman decides to turn the lights out so that no one can see each other, and it's going to be a fair fight. In reality, they didn't have the budget to shoot the fight sequence with all these different criminals and all these different scenes, so they just shot blackness with the sound effects and the, the words superimposed over the scene. But uh, that's part of the, the charm of the show, is that they, they got away with a lot of that stuff. But no amount of penny-pinching could save Batman. In 1968, Adam and Bert were stunned and deeply disappointed to learn that the show would not return for a fourth season. Batman and Robin to die? Is this really the end? Unbelievable! It was the network decision to cancel the series because it wasn't delivering a big enough audience of the right kind wasn't delivering 
enough adults who buy things. Yes, it is serious, perhaps far more serious than any of us yet realize. And on March 14, 1968, less than three years after its premiere, Batman aired its final episode in primetime. Yes, I'm looking forward to Minerva's famous eggplant jelly vitamin scalp massage. Minerva thought you might pop them into the persimmon pressurizer first. Persimmon pressurizer? Holy astringent plum like fruit! Only astringent until ripe, Robin. I think you'll find the experience most palatable this way, gentlemen. It seemed that Gotham City and the world had been saved for the last time by the dynamic duo. For Adam West and Burt Ward, however, there would be another, more difficult battle to fight. Batman, what eats crow, yells uncle, and tosses sponges? A loser, and I'm not a loser, Riddler. After its cancellation in 1968, Batman continued to play off and on in syndication, maintaining a loyal following. But as the years went on, the show started to lose its status as a pop culture phenomenon, and it seemed that audiences were laughing at the Caped Crusaders rather than with them. What is it, Batman? <laughs> Whatever it is, it's, it's awfully funny. <laughs> at the same time, Adam West and Burt Ward realized that they had become prisoners of their own success. There comes the tragic part, folks. The downside in a race that you're winning is, of course, when it's all over, you, you say, hey, what happened? I'm still here. Where's everybody else? Because you're charged up and you're ready to go on. It becomes uh, somewhat tough after because you try to go on and you try to play other roles. And those guys looked at you like, what? No, Adam, put him in bed with Faye Dunaway in this, oh, no, they wouldn't believe that. His cape might show. In 1978, Adam and Bert put their tights back on for a two-part superhero reunion special on the NBC network. But the results were disappointing and both stars found it harder and harder to separate themselves from their bat image. How do you like my costume? Hey! It is neat. Ironically, however, it was that very image that would help catapult them back onto center stage. In the late 1980s, Batman returned to the public eye as moviegoers around the world awaited a new big budget feature that would star Michael Keaton. The hype surrounding the upcoming film brought the original series back into the public eye. Here are the stars of that show, The Caped Crusaders, Adam West and Burt Ward. In 1988, Adam, Burt and the rest of the cast were reunited for a 20th anniversary celebration on Fox Television's The Late Show. Does this, uh, uh, this kind of response surprise you 22 years later, or is this... Uh... Holy adulation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Ross, Ross, that's a wonderful thing about uh, being a part of this uh, thing called Batman. People always have uh, a wonderful warmth and rapport wherever we go in the world. Yeah, it seems and that way. Uh, I guess we've just been around that long. I don't know. <laughs> the following year, the new Batman movie hit theaters across America, smashing box office records and making the dynamic duo hip once again. <laughs> Gotham City, it's TV's classic Batman. In response, Fox put the original Batman back into syndication and gathered many of the show's stars in Hollywood for promotional spots and public appearances. Julie Newmar, how are you, my old arch nemesis? Perfect. In 120 episodes, you said holy exactly 370 times. Holy, holy! Make that 372. Tune in again for the further adventures of Batman. Oh, Bert, you want to drive? Gosh, thanks, Adam. After two decades of typecasting and little meaningful work, Adam West and Burt Ward were thrilled to see the doors of Hollywood begin to open again. Batteries to power. Turbines to speed. 
And although both actors moved on to other roles, they acknowledged that they would always be recognized as Batman and Robin. Adam even poked fun at his own bad image with a guest spot on the popular TV show, The Simpsons, a series created by one of his childhood fans, Matt Groening. I have all the people we've had on the show, and we've had a lot. But Adam West really got all these guys <laughs> to come out of their writer's offices and actually sit there and go, oh my God, it's Batman. <laughs> oh, I guess you're only familiar with the new Batman movies, Michelle Pfeiffer. <laughs> the only true Catwoman is Julie Newmar, Lee Merriweather, or Eartha Kitt. And I didn't need molded plastic to improve my physique. Pure West. And how come Batman doesn't dance anymore? Remember the bat to see? <clears throat> Throughout the 1990s, Batman's popularity remained as high as ever all over the world. In 1999, a bat convention in Argentina drew 25,000 fans over a three-day weekend. The bomb detector of the Batmobile, it's flashing red. Quick, hit the radio control ejector button. Decades after it exploded onto the scene, Batman still packs a punch with audiences young and old with its unique blend of wacky humor and childlike adventure. When the donkey spelled with one letter, when it's you. Batman has remained a part of our culture. Sounds! What sounds? People see it as they grow up. Then their kids then watch Batman with them, and they enjoy it. It's something they can do together. To this day, anything that is quintessential Batman, like the utility belt, replica that's made and the costumes and that sort of stuff that is still very popular collectible and you can go on the, the auction sites online and, and you go to uh, these collectible shows and see that the prices are just going up and up and up I think because Batman the series was such a classic that there will always be a resurgence of Batmania from time to time and I think that's wonderful there's a tremendous warmth and love for their characters and I think uh, that it was a incredible opportunity that I got to portray Robin. That's one trouble with dual identities, Robin. Dual responsibilities. The show appeals on several levels. I have mail, for, for example, from 80-year-old Japanese industrialists. Man-eating lilacs, holy purple cannibals. And of course, the kids. But I think the reason Batman's hung out for so long is because it appeals to that spectrum of uh, cats.